Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And my guest today is Louis Giglio. <laughs> Welcome, Louis, to the, to the table. Thank you so much. Privilege uh, to be here. Louis is pastor at uh, Passion Church in, in Atlanta, Georgia, okay, <laughs> and uh, um, and a childhood friend for Andy, Andy Stanley. We're going to get put all the credentials that matter, right? That's right. And uh, um, and you ha- your life has been given to ministry, particularly to young people. And so that's what our topic is today: is to discuss young people. And the first question I always ask someone when we have a topic is, "So what pulled you into this gig? How, how did you?" <laughs> How'd you get started? Yeah, well, I think like everybody else, uh, I had no clue really what the plan was. So I graduated from seminary, and I wasn't really sure what the plan was still. Mm-hmm. That was another generation ago when your options were senior pastor, minister of education, youth pastor, missionary, mm-hmm. church administrator, mm-hmm. evangelist. Mm-hmm. So pick pick a box and yeah. get in it, and I hopefully didn't. that wasn't in the order you think about them in. But anyway, <laughs> and I, I didn't really see which one of those boxes I went in. So I went to grad school following seminary, pursued another degree, and in the meantime, while that happened, I went to uh, uh, Baylor University for grad school after seminary, mm. and during that time, God opened a door, a series of doors that plopped me right in the middle of college ministry. Mm-hmm. which was not one of the boxes that mm-hmm. I had been staring at for the last five years of life, thinking mm-hmm. if you're in ministry, it has to be one of those things. Mm-hmm. And that turned into a 10 years at Baylor University mm-hmm. of walking with college students every day mm-hmm. and trying to spur them on in a relationship with Jesus, um, which ended up through some transition in my family, leading us to Atlanta, leading us to Passion, and 21 years later, Passion Conferences. So. I I have no idea, to answer your question, Hmm. how I got into that gig, other than I sat across a table at a summer college retreat for a church in Houston Hmm. a few days before I went to grad school at Baylor, and a girl was sitting across the table. It wasn't my wife, although my wife and her were very close friends. She was a sophomore at Baylor, and she'd been a part of our summer ministry in Houston, And she just said very clearly to me, she said, um, Daryl, she said, you know, God's bringing you to Baylor for a reason. Hmm. That was it. And as soon as she said it, instantaneously I had clarity Hmm. on, I thought I'm going to go to grad school because Shelly's got one more year at Baylor. I love church state studies. It'll be a great degree to pursue. And then it just clarified, oh, God has put me here for a purpose. And I know what it is right now. Hmm. And so... I just would say to anybody watching us today that, you know, watch for those those clues and maybe don't spend so much time trying to write out the 15, 20, 25 year plan. <laughs> okay. All right. So so ditch the yellow pad and just see what God's doing, huh? Uh, let me let me uh, did was your time at Baylor connected to the university or was it connected to a church? Yeah, neither. Okay. So I went there as a grad student, uh, and I already had three summers under my belt mm-hmm. doing summer ministry with Baylor students in Houston. Mm-hmm. That's how I met my wife. And I dated her for two years while I was finishing seminary in Fort Worth. So mm-hmm. I spent every weekend that I was free at Baylor sleeping on some guy's couch or some guy's I've done floor that gig. Okay. of an apartment or a dorm somewhere. And uh, so we'd go to football games, we'd go out to dinner with Baylor kids, we went to church on Sunday morning. Uh, I knew Baylor like I was a Baylor student, Mm. and so by the time I went to grad school there, I understood the school, and I think it's fair to say um, I love Baylor. My wife's a regent at Mm -hmm. Baylor, tremendous respect for the school, Mm. but spiritually, I think it's fair to say at that time, it it was a school that was more about religion and less about a relationship with Mm. Jesus. And that's where I had seen the awakening come Mm. in this summer college ministry I was doing. Mm. Kids were coming alive to a relationship with Christ. And I knew that maybe we could see that happen on a macro. So about six of us prayed, uh, started a Bible study in an apartment clubhouse, the Arbor's apartment clubhouse Uh on a Monday night. About 40 students showed up. Uh And within two or three years, uh, 1,400 students were showing up Uh on Monday night. And we were just an independent, student-led movement. 
So you were a <laughs> you were a ministry plant that became a church, basically. We were a group of friends who uh-huh. started a Bible study, yeah. and uh, that Bible study ultimately um, died away about five years after we moved. I was there ten years. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was disabled in Atlanta. My mom was a primary caregiver for him for several years, uh, seven years of disability, mm. and I was seeking to get back to Atlanta to help my mom mm. all those seven years. Mm. Seven of the ten years we were at Baylor doing mm-hmm. choice Bible study, my mm. dad was disabled, uh, instantly disabled with a brain virus. And so mm. God finally released us in 1995 to go to Atlanta to help my mom. My dad died of a heart attack mm. right when we got to Atlanta. Oh, wow. And we had just left 10 years of ministry behind. Uh, the seed was planted in that time, as God sometimes does, for passion. Mm-hmm. Um, and then passion existed for, oh, I do the math, uh, 13 or 14 years mm-hmm. before Passion City Ch- Church was born. Mm-hmm. So it was Choice Bible Study first more of a global campus ministry organization movement second, Mm -hmm. local church third. Mm. So we kind of did everything backwards. Oh, wow. Normally people plan a church, out of the church grows a ministry, and from the ministry grows a movement. We had a ministry that turned into a movement Mm -hmm. that we asked the Lord to help us shrink down into a local expression of faith in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And we're nine years into that now, so Mm -hmm. we've sort of navigated that transition. Yeah, that's that's f- fascinating. Of course, college campuses have a way of of morphing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Facebook is phenomenal to mm-hmm. me. Uh, one of the greatest companies in the world, or at least most influential companies in the world. Two billion people, I think, mm-hmm. maybe have access to Facebook mm-hmm. and growing. And it all started with some college kids, mm-hmm. and overnight, boom. They started talking to each other and said, come here, basically? Uh, well, overnight, they started uh, rating the looks of other uh, students on their campus. So that's okay. how Facebook got started, uh, Okay, some version of that. But eventually, they had an inner, inner, inner network of communication. Uh-huh. Yeah, it spread to another campus and another campus and another campus, and uh-huh. you know Zuckerberg was right there at the heart of it. Yeah, all. you're talking about Facebook. I'm actually talking about how your in, your church oh. grew on campus was through it was it through Facebook primarily and communication. Uh, well, when like we that? started, uh, oh man, when we started our ministry at Baylor, there were no personal computers. So okay, <laughs> that oh, was a different okay. era. <laughs> all right, okay. I do remember the first Apple computer we yeah, got I, in I, our I, ministry well, office, yeah. and I thought the world. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, had don't go there. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, okay, so so you've launched Passion. Um, how did, okay, I know one answer to this question, and I'm going to rule it out before we start, and that is it's a God thing, which I get. But um, how, what is, how do you see what you did and how you go about it that has proved to be attractive? To college kids, what is what is it what is it about the way you approach ministry that uh, that makes ministry effective to college kids? Yeah, man. You know, I, I and honestly, I know you already did the disclaimer thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was the Lord. I couldn't I couldn't write that book. Huh. Interesting. Um, and I am actually pretty happy about that. Uh-huh. Um, I, I grew up under Charles Stanley. Mm-hmm. Um, when Charles Stanley came to be the associate pastor of the church I grew up in, mm-hmm. the church had about 3,000 people on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sunday he became the pastor of the church through great travail, mm-hmm. uh, I'm talking literal fisticuffs. Huh. Um, there we were are th- in the deep south. There were 300 people there. Uh-huh. The church went from 3,000 to 300. Uh-huh. I was a seventh grader. Oh, wow. So my middle school, high school years, I sat on the front row literally mm. and watched God turn 300 people mm. into what is now In Touch Ministries sure. and the influence of Charles Stanley around the world. Right. A right. church that had five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people coming on mm-hmm. a Sunday. Bought all the property in downtown Atlanta, um, spawned an international ministry, and I watched that happen. Mm-hmm. That was my first seminary education. Okay. And what I learned from it was that people are moved and attracted, both moved and attracted, by the preaching of the Word of God. Yes. The here it comes. Mm-hmm. Uh, no dodging any bullets, right? But but it's preached with passion, mm-hmm. and it's connected to real life. Mm-hmm. But it's not sugar coated in any way. Mm-hmm. And I saw the power of the preaching of the word, and I saw the power 
of a life of passion. Mm-hmm. And so the two things that I think are similar in everything I've ever been a part of, whether it was Choice Bible Study on the first night at Baylor mm-hmm. or Passion Conference a few weeks ago mm-hmm. in Atlanta and D.C., is put the Word front and center, mm-hmm. make it about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because the Holy Spirit loves magnifying Jesus, Mm -hmm. and he leverages his role in the Trinity to amplifying the story of Jesus. And so if that's your goal, Mm -hmm. is to amplify Jesus, then you've got a lot of wind, no pun intended, in your sail. Absolutely. And I think secondly, to try to create an environment where people can interact with God, not on an emotional level, but on an all human level, mm-hmm. intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally, and that's worship. Mm-hmm. It's corporate worship. It's informed by truth. It's anchored in the Word, mm-hmm. but it touches the heart mm-hmm. and it releases the tongue. So it makes the person whole. It makes a person whole. It honors God. It creates an atmosphere of powerful, miraculous, supernatural kingdom. And when you couple the preaching of the Word with a free expression of worship, and then you give people a purpose that's greater than themselves, somehow that that concoction, if you will, uh-huh. has worked. And there haven't been any frills or gimmicks along the way. We did 10 years of ministry at Baylor. We never served free food. Uh-huh. We didn't do a skit or a drama. Uh-huh. We didn't have a game or an activity. Uh-huh. In 10 years. Oh, man. Now, I'm a young life person, so you're stepping all over me. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, on any given Monday night, I would look up at 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 college students just sitting there, Bibles open, and I went, they want the truth. Yeah, they wanted to be fed, and you were feeding them. Yeah, it's great. It's a great lesson. I think it's important. I I, I do sense, um, just in the conversation and hearing you speak, that there is a, um, I don't know, I'm going to struggle for the right word. Um, there's an empathy and a sensitivity to where people are coming from that also seems to be a part of what you're what you're about. Um, in other words, it, it, if I can say it this way, it's not the it's not slamming the truth in someone's face. It's actually presenting the truth with an awareness of where where the the hurts and the and the needs. And in some cases, the blind spots of people are, if I can say it that way. Does, is, is, is that dimension of ministry an important part of, of – <laughs> of, I'm, I'm fishing. <laughs> well, I think everyone's great advantage as a, as a pastor slash minister is to be human. Mm-hmm. And I certainly qualify for that on mm-hmm. – I, I check all the boxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have some strengths. I have a lot of weaknesses. Mm-hmm. I've had some wins and I've had a lot of losses. Mm-hmm. I've been up to the mountaintop, but I've been way, way, way down in the dark valley. Mm-hmm. I've lost um, people I love. I've my family's walked through some very difficult times and seasons. I've experienced what I think A. W. Tozer says: God can't use a man greatly unless. He wounds him mm-hmm. greatly, or can't use him mightily unless he wounds him greatly. A lot of that doesn't fit in a lot of people's theology. That's right. But it certainly happened to Jesus that way. It was in the second half. <laughs> it was the entire second half of the discipleship program. Jesus taught the disciples, "You join me, you will get pushback and pain." So I think that this, the, our best advantage in ministry is to stay very much in touch with our own humanity. Mm-hmm. And so it keeps us from being arrogant and proud and mm-hmm. coming off like we uh, have got a message for the people. And boy, I'm going to tell all y'all something. It diffuses all that when you walk in going, I don't even belong up here mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. It's by the grace of God that I'm communicating anything, that I'm alive, that I'm saved. I think that is the framework. But I also think um, getting out and you know just observing life. I remember at Baylor, I did a, a series of messages on drinking. Mm-hmm. Now I don't have a big platform to stand on about whether you can or can't have a glass of wine, or it's terrible to have a beer with the guys. Um, obviously, alcoholism and being drunk are sins, mm-hmm. and so that's clear. Mm-hmm. You, you have to fine tune down to sort of the kind of have a beer with the guys message. But it was a pretty big epidemic on our campus, Baptist University. I lived on campus, so Mm -hmm. I spent about eight weekends picking up all the beer cans and bottles out of my own apartment 
Complex. parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Putting them in these big black hefty trash bags mm-hmm. and stashing them in this storage closet. So when I gave the message, I had about eight bags out on the front of the stage at this church we were meeting in. And I said, I know this isn't a big issue at Baylor. And then I just went to the first bag and shook it and just push all down the stairs with the cans and bottles <laughs> after eight bags of that. It was an unbelievable sight at uh-huh. the front of this church. And uh-huh. I said, so I know this isn't a real super relevant issue uh-huh. for those of us here today, but just for the few people that might relate to, let's talk about it for uh-huh. a little bit together. Uh-huh. Well, obviously... You, you. There was a pretty, pretty big amount of gravity in the room at that moment, right? And I think some of that's just observing life and being human, and then speaking out of that or speaking the truth into that. Yeah, and uh, which raises another issue that I think is important about ministry, particularly to this age group, and that is, I think we might have just shocked a few people by the way that Baylor kids uh, drink. uh, uh, Sorry, uh, I had to uh, be the one to say that. Yeah, well. I'll let you get the mail, okay? <laughs> um, uh, I, I think what's underneath this is is another thing the kids are wrestling because they're wrestling with life is they they want the church to tackle um, the difficult spaces that kids are negotiating mm-hmm. as they move through, and there in many cases, many of these kids are negotiating these spaces on their own for the first time. If they've come out of some Christian homes that you and I are probably very aware of, where where they've been, where parents have tried to be parents but have been perhaps um, uh, extremely attentive, okay, if I can say it that way, um, uh, all of a sudden they find themselves having to make decisions they've never had to make for themselves before, and they're and they're wrestling with that and who they are in the midst of that and what that means about who they are and what they've been told about what they should and shouldn't do and the, Potential freedoms that they have in being there, et cetera. It seems all that makes for a college ministry that if it doesn't engage in the in the in the challenges of of being that particular in that particular situation at that particular age, um, there there's a disconnect between is God engaged with all my life. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that that's where you f- default back to what we talked about a moment ago. Mm-hmm. You you just teach the word, mm-hmm. and if, as you do that, if you're not, um, you know, anchored in your four key favorite passages, mm-hmm. but you're trying to really open the word up to people, mm-hmm. what you find is the miracle of the word. It speaks to all the different facets of our lives. Mm -hmm. It transcends centuries and millennia Mm -hmm. and just rolls right up into the present tense dilemma Mm -hmm. of what it is to be alive in our day. Mm -hmm. And it speaks across all the issues that people are wrestling with, struggling with, and it shines light into our world. And I think that's a key component for people who don't want just uh, you know, some top-level theological subjects, but they, they want to know, how can I navigate life? Yeah, I, 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 I sometimes talk about this in relationship to our work at the center, that what seminaries have tended to do is to do a good job of going from the Bible to life. You know, here's this passage and here how it connects to your life. Unfortunately, that's not how most people interact with their Bibles. Most people who interact with their Bibles take their life situations mm-hmm. and go to the Bible and say, help me. Right. That move is not the same kind of move, and mm-hmm. it's not the same kind of reading. And, and, and I like to challenge the people that I interact with, and particularly the people who are teaching people how to be teachers, we got to teach our people how to switch hit. That's it. And, and be able to go both ways, to take this situation, which because it's life in a fallen world, is messy. Mm-hmm. And, and the mess is in front of you. You can talk about what the ideal should look like, and that's not the space that's being occupied. Now, how do I live out of that yeah. messy place? Yeah. And 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 one, first make sense of it. Two, figure out how to go about trying to f- to fix it as much as I can. Three, deal with the consequences of the choices already made, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems to me real pastoral ministry um, meets that challenge in a in a in a really significant way. Yeah, I think what you're saying is important though. I think it's a philosophical shift mm-hmm. 
And it's not just about how we approach the Word. It's about how we approach everything with God. Mm -hmm. I have a life and a set of variables, and when I need input from God, Mm -hmm. I will find that. I'll Mm -hmm. either go to church, show up, Mm -hmm. open my Bible, look for a text, um, enter into a dialogue with a pastor because I I need input at this point versus that mentality that says that the Bible doesn't exist necessarily as a solution to my problems. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, But I I try to help this generation understand and remind myself, church isn't for me, church is for God. The Mm -hmm. the great assembly Mm -hmm. isn't so that I can get four points that are practical for me this week. Yeah, and I'm not a consumer coming to a a, product. The great assembly is uh, redeemed voices amplifying Mm -hmm. a redeemer. Mm -hmm. It's a recalibration of life and everything in life Mm -hmm. where God, again, is seen as all-sufficient and all-worthy. And glorious, and the Bible is about God. Mm-hmm. It's not about me. Mm-hmm. Heaven exists for the glory of God, not for me. The cross wasn't all about me. The mm-hmm. cross, Jesus said, when He said in John, uh, "So what should I say? Save me from this hour." No, it was for this hour that I came. Mm-hmm. Father, glorify Your name. Yeah. So we know the cross is about. God's glory. Mm -hmm. The Word is about God. Church is for God. All of this exists for God. And I think when we have inverted that, Mm -hmm. then of course we're going to miss everything in the equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's it's, the way I like to describe it is is that oftentimes when we process what goes uh, goes on around us in life, the arrow is pointed towards us. And we see everything in terms of how I'm impacted by what's going on around me. The Bible likes to take that arrow, which is instinctively there, and just shove it Mm. in a different direction. (laughs) And that direction is actually twofold. Mm. One is up and the other is out. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm looking to him and if I look to him and am connected to him and I have a solid identity in him mm-hmm. so that I don't need to be afraid of what's going on around me because I think a lot of people react out of fear and a lack of of self-acceptance. Uh, I'm in a better possession to become vulnerable not just an open before God but also vulnerable and in a way that serves other people and I become less concerned about how I'm how how I'm viewed and what I'm doing because I understand what I'm supposed to be about absolutely you know my dad uh, designed the chick-fil-a logo in 1964 hmm. my dad was a graphic designer fast forward to my dad became disabled did not design or go to work or play golf or drive a car or dress himself again for the last seven years of his life went from being this genius to this disabled, mentally and physically handicapped person, died in 1995 of a heart attack, crashed into my whole move to Atlanta, Mm -hmm. left me in the dark and in the clouds and in a fog, basically, like Mm -hmm. we just left all of that to come Mm -hmm. for this, and now he's gone. Mm -hmm. And um, fast forward up to Passion 2013, biggest event Passion's ever done, in a football stadium, 60,000 college students, stage in the center of the field, four days, I'm leading it. Underneath the terraplast on top of the field is my dad's logo from the Chick-fil-A Bowl the night before we started. Oh, man. And so when we take the focus off of us, Mm -hmm. it doesn't answer all the questions, but it just helps us trust again that God's in the equation. He's working a plan. And so... I've got a real simple question. So you don't use skits, okay? You don't use drama, et cetera, et cetera. So and you so you present the word. So the question is: So what? How do you engage? What do? You, what is it? How is it that you go about actually engaging the student and drawing them into the word? Well, I mean, we're talking across the gamut of life. You know, uh, the question sort of rooted back in 1985, Arbor's Apartments Clubhouse first time we ever gather all the way up to Passion City Church today two two or three different you know epochs of time happened mm-hmm. in between there but i think it's staying um, alive and having a fire and a passion for jesus is the way you engage any generation i think it's opening your mouth and engaging people and they have a instantaneous assessment process especially mm-hmm. this younger generation mm-hmm. very uh, skeptical generation mm-hmm. Not that all of us who are older aren't, Mm -hmm. but they have that sixth sense for authenticity, for trustworthiness, for the the ethos and pathos layer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, it's coming across as someone who truly loves God, Mm -hmm. 
uh, believes in the story of the gospel, Mm -hmm. not just as telling the story of the gospel, Mm -hmm. is moved by the power of the cross, Mm -hmm. and is alive in the spirit Mm -hmm. to do uh, the things that God has put before us to do, to join in the greater mission of God, to touch and change the world, Mm -hmm. starting with where we are, uh, our Jerusalem, and then moving out into the corners of society, culture, and earth. And so I don't know how, how to answer the question, how do we engage college students, other than to say we have a reputation. They know that they're going to be challenged, moved, encouraged, fed if they come to passion. Mm-hmm. And so they come with that expectation. I'm going to be challenged there. I know that. I'm going to be moved. I'm going to be encouraged there. I'm going to be fed there. And I'm going to look around and realize I'm a part of a greater story. And this is one of the gifts of passion. It's not everybody's calling to gather 30,000, 40,000 people in Mm -hmm. events and stadiums and arenas. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, it's part of our calling and part of our stewardship and Mm -hmm. part of our anointing, actually, to do that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the gifts we offer to students is you can walk into this arena from the University of Idaho or Boise State Mm -hmm. or South Dakota State University or you name a school that's not Texas A&M or Auburn (laughs) or the University of Georgia Uh or Clemson where Uh there's hundreds if not thousands of believers floating around. Mm -hmm. But you can walk into this arena, you can look around and say, I'm here representing the Blue Hens of Delaware Mm -hmm. and I am not alone. Mm -hmm. I love this Jesus. I believe in this kingdom. And I felt for the last semester at school like I must be the only living college student Mm. who believes all of this. But I'm not alone, and there's a power in that. Interesting. Now, how important is 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 music and worship to what you do? Uh, it, 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 you know, I, I'm I'm actually in the midst of writing a commentary on Ephesians right now. Today, my passage was, you know, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I'm right <laughs> after I, I got filled with a fierce spirit yesterday, and today I'm <laughs> I'm singing. So, uh, so and, and and what strikes me in studying that passage mm. is, however, you talk grammatically about how the two parts are related, which is an interesting discussion that New Testament people have. <laughs> um, what's clear is there's an environment that um, that surrounds and that um, catalyzes your ability to be open to the Spirit of God. Hmm. Well, I, I would say it this way, and I, and I would have guessed that our audience by and large would be people on the pastoral side, uh-huh. mm-hmm. the preaching leadership side of the equation. I think this is the most important conversation that we could have mm-hmm. because this false dichotomy between preaching and worship, yes, between pastoral leadership and the creative arts in the church, right. it's uh, it's not biblical, yeah, nor is it gospel driven. Yeah, Psalm forty says, "I cried out to the Lord; He heard my cry; He lifted me up out of this miry pit." Uh-huh. And then what did He do? He did two things. He set my feet on a rock, Mm -hmm. and he put a new song in my mouth. Mm -hmm. This is the result of salvation. Mm -hmm. We get a foundation, and we get an anthem. Mm -hmm. And everyone has an anthem. Mm -hmm. Everyone on planet Earth has an anthem. Mm -hmm. Music is not uh, – worship and and music are not an offshoot for the church. It's, It's the expression of the entire world. Mm -hmm. It's just we have a redeemed song and a song of hope and a great foundation. So I I didn't say it in chapel today here, but it's good to say it here. The pastor is the – senior pastor is the worship leader of every church. Mm -hmm. There may be a guy with a guitar that has that title, but the senior pastor is the lead worshiper of the church. And so – uh, heaven is about worship. This is clear from the revelation of John. Um, it, all through the epistles, we see woven through the story. When we take one step back and look at what we're reading, we see the songs of praise of the church. Um, and so this is the way it works in life. And so at Passion, I would say to answer your question, worship is integral is integral in everything that we do because there is no way to separate the gospel from worship. Yeah, and I think that that's the thing that strikes me in having done this work in this passage very, very recently is is the recognition of the relationship between what it means to be filled with the Spirit and the in the environment that is associated with it, which is this pre- – you talked earlier about the spotlight and effect being on God. Well. What is what good worship 
is the spotlight being on God and expressing that from the heart, mm-hmm. um, reaffirming and reestablishing that connection that allow that drives us uh, spiritually, etc. And I guess I've been in 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 churches where I've seen the worship almost disconnected from the message of the mm-hmm. word, or almost treated as either a prelude, oftentimes as a prelude to the word, but but not valued as important in and of itself, or even seen to connect it to what mm-hmm. comes later. And I go, there's a loss of something here uh, when when that's the approach, as opposed to really wrestling with. Um, in fact, when I preach, if I get the opportunity, I really like to be asked. What music should go with what you're doing? Yeah. Because because to me, the music is is, is par, in one sense a part of the sermon. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's introducing <laughs> the theme and the and, and what you want people thinking about as they come into what you're talking about. And if you integrate those, uh, it just it just seems to me to make more sense. Mm-hmm. If I wasn't sitting here with you uh, right now. Literally, I would be sitting at another table mm-hmm. with our worship pastors, our creatives, our production people, talking about our gatherings coming up on Sunday at Passion mm-hmm. City. Um, I think it's it's just helpful for the pastor to overcome if he if he has any uh, shortcomings or insecurities about music or the arts mm-hmm. to try to cr- climb over that wall mm-hmm. and to just go sit down. At the table with these young artisans, these creatives, mm-hmm. and forge a relationship and a friendship to help them a bolster their theological perspective on what they're doing. Sure, and then for him to feel more connected to the flow of what God's Spirit is doing in and through the church. The songs travel further than the messages. Mm-hmm. Uh, we sang a song in chapel this morning that just won a Grammy Sunday night. That's right. That was written. Uh, a year ago mm-hmm. on another continent mm-hmm. that has been sung now in every church in the world mm-hmm. in one year's time. Yep. Uh, what a beautiful name. Yep. A great anthem uh, and theologically very strong. Mm-hmm. So it's a win-win. Yep. It's a heartfelt, you want to pump your fist in the air, yep. you want to shout, you feel God's moving in the assembly mm-hmm. in, in a confession of this kind of a declaration of the victory of God. So there's every layer being tapped into there, and if the pastor is over looking over his notes for the seventh time mm-hmm. or scanning the crowd for, you know, who's here today, it's telegraphing to the church, this isn't important mm-hmm. to me. Right, right. What's important to me is that they'll finish this, yeah. and then I can do the thing that's the most important thing, which is preach my message. Right. And I, as a preacher, I would just say it simply this way. Your message isn't the most important thing. Mm-hmm. The Word of God is the central thing. Mm-hmm. Jesus is the central thing. But your sermon mm-hmm. may or may not be the central thing. And I tell you, people get healed in our church during the worship. And when I say the worship, I mean the music, because mm-hmm. I, I hope my sermon is worship. Mm-hmm. They get they get encouraged. They get convicted. People get saved mm-hmm. during the music. Mm-hmm. People's testimony is: I came to your church, and during the singing, mm-hmm. something happened to me. Mm. Isn't that powerful? That is powerful. And you know, I think about it. I'm someone who's not musically trained. I mean, my 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 mom wanted me to play piano. I hated it. <laughs> okay, uh, I learned. I, I did one recital in my life: Peter and the Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so I'm not musically inclined at all. Um, you know, I can't play the guitar or anything else. I might be able to beat on drums, but I've never tried it. So I'm as musically handicapped as anyone in the room. But but what I do, what I am, and what everybody, everyone, everyone sings. Everyone can sing. Everyone can be drawn into music, whether they can play it or not. Yeah, and so so. My thinking is, is, as someone who speaks in relationship to the music, is wrestling with, with you know this this coherence of mm-hmm. what's happening in the worship hour yeah. for people, and and frankly, with as digital, visual, and visceral as this generation is, mm-hmm. um, that's important in touching the whole person. Absolutely, and I think that we miss the mark when we get stuck down in our outlines. Mm-hmm. 
and people aren't coming in to church. I mean, it's hard for me to really swallow, Mm -hmm. but we know that people forget 90% of what they hear within Mm -hmm. 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, the best lesson for anyone like me Mm -hmm. in my line of work Mm -hmm. is to go to my own team, Mm -hmm. not Joe working at the bank. Yeah, yeah. Not Sally, who's running the IT company. When I go around to my own team on a Thursday Mm -hmm. and say, can you give me the key text from last Sunday? Mm Mm-hmm. Can you give me one point? I had four. Can you just give me one? Can you do you remember the main axiom of the of the of the message? Uh, you get a lot of blank stares back. And so what we have to realize is this is an inch by inch progression. Mm-hmm. It's a slow growth process. And everything sensory helps the process. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't dilute the word, obviously. We're not trying to turn this thing into a multimedia presentation, but if there is some multimedia that helps you make your point, why not? Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, I I preach differently than a lot of my friends who are very outline-driven and some even manuscript-driven. I I try to paint a picture for people Mm -hmm. that they can remember. Like Mm -hmm. I remember going to that church, and I don't remember all the words, but I remember the painting that guy painted. And if we can do that consistently over time and then get people tethered into the word in more of a small group setting or a a daily journey setting, I think we're going to win. But it just helps when the pastor is leading the charge in that. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't uh, divested to a couple worship guys or worship girls, worship team down here and said, I'll just go and do the message and y'all do whatever. Because A, there's a worship diet that's important. Mm -hmm. So we can't sing all the same kind of songs with the same message. We got to... We got to serve a meat and a vegetable and a dessert's nice sometimes, and maybe even something green on and the plate. It, and it isn't like people don't have different tastes out and there in terms can, of music. It, you know, so it's, <laughs> yeah. it's that it's what are we? Is, are all these songs about I feel good because God loves me? Is yeah. that the whole day, or do we get any ballast in the boat today? Yeah, right. About something true about the character of God. So mm-hmm. it's the diet is important, the theme is important, the continuity is important. The The continuity of the whole gathering is important. We're trying to do the same thing here today. We're trying to say one thing today. Yeah. And if we get on the same page to do that, I think we serve the people. You know, another thing that strikes me in in thinking through your example about the content of the sermon is I do think one thing that that people do catch, even if they can't regurgitate (laughs) the specific content of the sermon, is they get the pastor's heart. Mm Mm-hmm. They get they get who the pastor is as a person. So if you, you've got a a, a pile driving <laughs> preacher, if you can get it that way, just you know that that that's one thing. And if you get the person, they they get that they because they that that is almost unconsciously processed, mm-hmm. if I can say it that way. Um, and, and so uh, that they they can tell the person who's scripted from the pulpit. Yeah. Versus the person who – that person is talking to us from their heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, although I think it's uh, – there might be some differences across generations, I think that that's a characteristic the younger generation is a little more sensitive to because they have been, again, so visual and so digital and so much – they've processed so much of their life through what they have seen and through what they have heard mm-hmm. – versus what they have read. And uh, um, I, I like to tell people, I don't mean to go on long, but I like to tell people the difference between my generation and the generation that followed me is I grew up processing information, thinking through outlines yeah. and structure. A younger person grew up processing information on a web page. Mm-hmm. A story. A, a story, a picture, Okay, which means that you don't go to a web page, okay, that's the first thing I can click, that's the second thing I can click, that's the third thing I can click, that's the fourth thing I can click. Okay? And therefore, if you click off four of those things, okay, so your you summary to, is yeah, exactly. this, that, no, and the other. You, you have a myriad of choices, and you can go in any direction yeah. you want. And, I say, and I've tried to say our teaching needs to wrestle with the fact that information has been processed in a completely different way. And I'm not, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm not mm-hmm. putting right or wrong over that at all. Different, yeah. And in the midst of that difference, is is another way of communicating, and sometimes that way of communicating gets its spaces and places wow. that the outline does not yeah, touch. That's great. And so, um, 
that you know I, I think that sometimes we we forget that and and so when I find myself defending the younger generation, which I do a lot, I, I travel a lot, and, and the standard question I get when I'm in an audience over 45 and I open it up, I know that one question I will get during the time is, what's wrong with the younger generation? Okay? <laughs> All right? So I pull out my hair and I get more and more of my hairline. Because what I want to do is I want to – you know, I teach this, this age group, and, and I go – I'm not sensing the problems that you're sensing. I may have some concerns, but the but the heart is in the right place and the desire is mm-hmm. in the right place, and they just want to learn. But they learn differently yeah. than what we're used to. I I couldn't agree more. I, I grew up in a very outline driven world, and I have a a logically processing mind anyway. So it was a perfect storm for me, mm-hmm. listening to Charles Stanley give an expository message mm-hmm. three times a week mm-hmm. for over a decade of my life. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Mm-hmm. But um, when I look at the difference between our 930 gathering at Passion City, which is a lot of people who are in, in our age zone, mm-hmm. people with a lot of experience in church, and then I look at the 5 o'clock gathering at the p.m., which is heavily hundreds and hundreds of 18 to 25 year olds in the first all the rows I see mm-hmm. right in front of me they they're not they're not looking for the outline mm-hmm. in their journal if you look at their journals on Instagram and mm-hmm. see what they wrote at the end of your lecture mm-hmm. it's a it's a uh, flow chart drawing mm-hmm. that's artistic mm-hmm. and it's big word mm-hmm small print under it with mm-hmm. a big arrow that curves over here to mm-hmm. a big conclusion and then a, a little bit of a sketch drawing and then your four points over here and they're literally artistically interpreting in, in, interpreting mm-hmm. the the message in some cases they've put it in their own words and it wasn't anything you said but it's something that. that triggered in them and the next thing you know no kidding they got a tattoo yeah of something you said in an image that they created. Yeah. We used one of the students' images in my talk at Passion. I did a series on Acts. I talked about the flaming arrow, mm-hmm. who we are. Uh, we stole off of Instagram a girl's flaming arrow that she had drawn huh. in her Bible. Huh. And we recreated it for mm-hmm. our art for the series. Uh-huh. And I used it at the conference this year. And the thing that you'll see down, if you go the hashtag, is a lot of the image of this flaming arrow. Mm-hmm. And yes, it does have some words on it and some arrows and a whole message underneath it, mm-hmm. but it's the imagery that's powerful. Jesus was a master at that, and mm-hmm. God Almighty is a master of it. He put us in a universe. Why did he put us in this giant cosmos? Because mm-hmm. he knew we needed imagery. Mm-hmm. And so it's not uh, it's not disrespectful to the text. No, in fact, to I... To create an image and a picture that people can't or forget. Or tell stories. Amen. I, 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 you know, I... I the, the I sometimes hear the complaint, well, this generation likes stories and we want doctrine. And I'm sitting here going, if you will look at the inspired Word of God, I think you will see a lot of narrative in those be- between covers. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and that's because story is, is subtle in a way that oftentimes doctrine is not. Mm-hmm. And, and stories seep in. Wow. In a way that great. doctrine does not. That's great. And so um, – uh, And so, if you got a doctrinally sound story, exactly. now you're winning. Exactly right. And that's what the Scripture is. Because the doctrine is. is seeping in. Exactly. That's what the Scripture is. The Scripture are doctrinally sound stories that present the dilemmas of life like the ones we find ourselves. Most of those characters aren't perfect. <laughs> and, and, and boom, you're in. And so – I think there's something attractive about unfolding the Word of God to an age group that is narrative sensitive out of a Bible that is a lot of narrative. Hmm. I couldn't agree more. And I think that, uh, you know, just for myself, I'm almost 60. And anybody in my age zone, it, it's good for us to make it one of our ambitions this year to try to become better communicators mm-hmm. to new generation listeners. Mm-hmm. That's a good goal because versus saying, I, you know, I don't know how to do that, and I don't even know if I want to do that, and I've only got a few more years anyway, why bother? I think our, our longevity and contribution to the future kingdom work of God is to learn to continually evolve 
as generational communicators. Yeah, I, in fact, you're going where I wanted to end up on this, which is um, uh, I may not have a choice, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because in 10, 15 years, I'm out of here, and the church will be what's coming up next. Yeah. So, so I better invest in what's coming up next, uh, not necessarily to replicate exactly who I am, but hopefully to replicate the values that need to be present yeah. so they can be who they are in yeah, the way God absolutely. has them. Well, Louis, I, I really do appreciate you taking the time to be in mm. with us and be a part of this. This has been – It's been a treat for me. I, I wish you talked a lot more oh, no, no, at no. the end of it. If no. I come back, will you talk the whole time? Uh, no, we, we, we'll just we'll – <laughs> we, we, we need to do this on occasion, just kind of update and keep it rolling because this has been fun. And uh, we wish you all the best at Passion. Thank you for your association with us. I love it. And we thank you for being a part of the table and we hope to see you again soon thanks for listening to the table podcast for more podcasts like this one visit dts.edu slash the table dallas theological seminary teach truth love well